Hello and welcome to episode 50 of the Motivational Millennial Podcast. Today we are talking with actor extraordinaire Lee Norris. You may <laughs> recognize him from some of your favorite shows as a child or as an adolescent or some of your favorite films as a young, wistful millennial. <laughs> So we had a fantastic conversation. Lee is such a reflective and generous and insightful person. And we hope that you will stick around after the interview for the after show where Ivy and I share our biggest takeaways. And if you are looking for a little extra transformation in your life, we have written a personal transformation guide that contains eight key motivational tools, action steps, and reflection questions to help us all overcome the four primary limiting beliefs that tend to hold us back as millennials. So you can get that for free by going to motivationalmillennial.com slash free gift. And we would love to know what you think after you read it. If you've used some of those action steps, we've been getting some great feedback from people who have shared some of their really fascinating life changes with us and it's such a privilege and honor to support you so definitely check that out and right now it's time for the man the myth <laughs> the minkus oh and the legend <laughs> lee norris Woo. Hello, welcome to the Motivational Millennial Podcast, where we talk with inspiring members of the millennial generation who are living life with a sense of purpose and achieving their dreams. I'm Blake Brandis. And I'm Ivy LeClaire. Our Motivational Millennial guest today is Lee Norris. Lee has been acting in TV and film for the past 26 years. He is perhaps best known for his role as Mouth McFadden on the drama series One Tree Hill. Lee made his TV debut as a regular on the Torkelsons, followed by Almost Home, and later appeared as fan favorite Stuart Minkus in Boy Meets World. His film credits include David Fincher's critically acclaimed thrillers Gone Girl and Zodiac, as well as the indie film Blood Done Sign My Name. Lee, welcome to the show. Thank you, Blake and Ivy. It's great to be here. Oh, we are so excited to have you with us. Thank you. I know. It's a good excuse to catch up. It's been too long. I won't say how long because then you'll figure out how old I am. <laughs> Well, the good news is you're a millennial. Um, <laughs> uh, just barely, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> That's right. You're on the cusp. Yeah. yeah. For our audience, Lee and I went to Wake Forest together and performed in an acapella group, which was <laughs> an amazing experience. And Lee, are you still singing at all? Is that something you still are into? You know, my singing these days is limited to the shower in the car when I'm stuck <laughs> on the freeway, pretty much. <laughs> I wish I had an outlet for it. I really loved doing it at Wake, and you were incredible, by the way. Oh, thank you. And I feel like it's gotten cooler <laughs> since I left college <laughs> because I think, like, the Pitch Perfect movies came out, and it, somehow it just seems cooler now. Maybe it's not, but I wish that it was, you know, that cool when, when I was doing it. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're right. Glee and all of the yeah. other forms of yeah, media. Yeah, the sing-off, all those things have kind of made it in vogue, so... That's awesome. Go acapella nerds. Exactly. Well, we'll probably loop around to that later as well. Yeah. But Lee, would you mind telling us what you're up to at the moment and what you're loving about it? Sure. It's kind of an interesting time for me. And as you alluded to in the intro there, I've been working as an actor for 26 years since I was nine. So now you know how old I am. If you, <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't figure it out already. And... For me, I'm actually living in Los Angeles with my wife, and I'm in a bit of a period of career transition. I'm still acting. I have my representation, my manager, and my agent, but I'm exploring ways to try to move to the business side of the entertainment industry, which is interesting. For somebody who's been around for the business for a long time, I mean, it's not easy to just pick up and move to a different side of the industry. It involves a lot of willing to start over and kind of prove yourself. And so in order to achieve that, I've been working at my management company, which is also a small production company, doing script coverage. And I'm taking classes on sort of the business aspects of the industry and really just trying to challenge myself to learn more about an industry that I already know a lot about, but mainly one aspect of it. And I'm trying to grow beyond that and look for, you know, a little bit more stability than what you generally find as an actor. And so it's kind of an interesting time. That is so fascinating that you have undertaken at this point in your life such what I would say is a real challenge to go back and 
learn something new and try an entirely different skill set. I'm wondering, has that been difficult or what was the impetus for you to go back? Because I think most people, you know, if they spend, like you said, 26 years getting really good at something, <laughs> would probably be like, I'm going to stick with that thing. I know it. I could do it well. So what was that inspiration for you to try something new? Sure. Well, you know, a lot of different things. I mean, I think one thing was 26 years is a long time, especially in a field like acting where there's a lot of you've probably heard people in the entertainment industry and you yourself probably know there's a lot of rejection that comes along with being an actor where you're constantly going on auditions and you generally are told no more than you're told yes. And that certainly takes a mental toll, even when you've had some success and been you know, generally successful. That still takes a bit of a toll on you. And you know, also once I'd kind of accomplished a lot of the things that I wanted to do, not to say that I accomplished everything I'd like to do as an actor, but when I felt like I'd, you know, been on this TV show, I did Wintry Hill for 10 years. After you've done that, you kind of start to look around and say, I feel a little stagnant. I want to grow and I want to challenge myself. And I think it's always important to keep growing and learning, you know, even if you're comfortable in something, I think sometimes to get out of that comfort zone and challenge yourself can take you to new places that, you may have never anticipated going. And that's kind of where I am. You know, like I said, I haven't stopped acting. I think it's important to recognize that it helps me pay my bills and I'm not going to, you know, give up the legwork that I've done there, but it is a transition that I'm starting to try to make at this point. And, you know, I have some advantages in terms of obviously I know a lot of people in the industry, but as I alluded to, it's also difficult because you do sort of have to start over and prove yourself and say, well, I'm more than just a person who can recite lines. I understand how, you know, ratings work and copyright laws and, you know, all of these things that go into the intricate details of getting a film or a a TV show made. It's so interesting that you spend so long working on your craft and showing people that you're good at it. But then also on the flip side, it puts you in this box and you're like, this is not the only thing that I can do. And you've got to create a new identity, essentially, around the thing that you're wanting to create next. You do. You know, I think it happens in more than just the entertainment industry, but certainly, particularly in this industry, it becomes very easy, like you said, to just kind of put people in a box and especially as an actor. And that often is something you have to fight as an actor, even just with getting cast that you're Mm -hmm. often put into boxes as as, well, you're this kind of person and that's all you can do. And so, you know, I've had to really fight not just in this period of my life of transition, but also as an actor to really look for some kind of different roles to, you know, to prove that I'm a little bit more versatile than just, you know, Minkus on Boy Meets World (laughs) (laughs) and being the nerd. So it's all been very exciting and I hope it's interesting and can help, you know, anybody who's out there who might be interested in this field. What have you learned about yourself since shifting your direction? And in some ways, like Ivy was saying, your identity. Well, I've learned that I feel like I'm willing to take risks, take chances. As you mentioned, it's a difficult decision to kind of leave something behind that's been pretty good to me and to my family. But I think I've learned what's so important to me, which I've touched on, is just that to stay mentally engaged because you know, if you're fortunate enough to have some financial security and you have a great family life and things are going well, but you're not feeling really challenged in what you're doing career wise, you know, it can take a toll on you. And so I've just learned it's important to not just rest on what I've done in the past and to kind of challenge myself to go further. And I've learned that, you know, it's definitely challenging as someone at my age, you know, I'm sitting in this class right now. It's a night class at UCLA and I'm surrounded by people who are much younger than I am. (laughs) And, you know, it's very interesting to be at this point in my life and sitting in the classroom again, which I haven't been in for since 2004. And to just realize that, you know, no matter what you've done, no matter how many TV shows you've been in or who you've worked with, when you're sitting in the classroom, you're the equal of everybody else. You know nothing and you're there to learn and be molded. And so it's been very, you know, humbling and interesting for me. Well, I just want to acknowledge the bravery that it takes to make that kind of shift and to really have listened to what you really wanted and what you really wanted to create for your life and going ahead and taking that leap. Well, thank you. I need you guys to be my cheerleader every day. I'll just call (laughs) you. Absolutely. So I'm curious to know how you feel that 
your identity was shaped. We keep talking about identity, but <laughs> it's one of the things we're thinking about. Sure. But yeah. How do you feel that your identity was shaped by being as a child in the limelight, essentially? Yeah, it was interesting. I mean, certainly as a kid, I grew up in North Carolina. So I, it's not like I grew up in Los Angeles or New York where there are more kind of child actors who are actually already making a career out of it at that age. You know, I grew up in North Carolina watching the Cosby show and had no access to an agent or anything at that time. And just, you know, knew that I wanted to be on television, but I didn't really know how to make it happen. And thank God my parents were supportive and didn't just laugh at me. <laughs> but, you know, they encouraged me to do children's theater and things like that. And then because there actually are studios in North Carolina in Wilmington, there eventually was an outlet for me to start auditioning for things. And so when I ended up on my first show, The Torkelsons, you know, I was nine and we flew out to LA and I started doing the show and it was amazing. And then after the show ended, my mom and I would always go back to North Carolina because I was still enrolled in school there, you know, and I would pick back up in the middle of the school year just going to class again after having filmed this TV show. And it was certainly, as far as identity goes, it was, I think it could have gone a couple of different ways. But for me, I think when I got back to class and kids saw that I was pretty much the same kid, that I wasn't walking around school wearing like a robe and sunglasses and <laughs> asking for a bottle of water, you know, I think when they saw that I was pretty much the same, you know, it allowed me to just sort of assimilate and just, you know, become a kid again. And for me, that was really important to keeping my own sense of identity because it kept me grounded and didn't make me feel like, you know, I was better than someone else just because I'd gotten to achieve this cool dream that I had. So, you know, I really credit my parents and credit the teachers and the faculty that I worked with at the schools for kind of helping me do this kind of really unique thing as a kid. How did you deal with all those competing pressures to not just of balancing your acting life with your school life and trying to integrate back into the school year, but also having to deal with what I assume are the pressures that come with having the shows that you were on be massive hits, you know, from Torkelson's to Boy Meets World, obviously, and then sure, One Tree yeah. Hill, like... How did you balance all of those pressures simultaneously? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing for me to keep in perspective was it's always a job. And I learned very early on how fickle the business is that as wonderful as it can be, it can also be very fleeting and it can end very quickly. You know, I saw kids who came on as guest stars on Boy Meets World, for example, who were there at the table reading the first day of work and by the next day they'd been replaced with somebody else wow. and it was very you know at this point I'm 12 but you know you sort of learn that it's a business very quickly and so you are exposed to those pressures of okay well this is fun and I've made it this far but I have to perform I have to do a job and I have to do it well otherwise I could be the one who doesn't show up you know at work the next day and so for me, it was just important, like I said, to have that balance of a good family life and a good life outside of acting. You know, my parents always stressed to me that I was more than just an actor to them. I was Lee. I was a kid who was into soccer and tennis and I played violin and I had all these other interests and passions outside of acting that kind of made me feel like, you know, if this all goes away tomorrow, if the show's canceled, if I get fired, if something happens, then, you know, my identity wasn't just tied up in that, that there was more to me than that and that I could go on and have a great life and do other things. And that's really the best way that I dealt with the pressure. And, you know, certainly as you get older, you start to face different pressures. You know, as I mentioned, stability becomes something that's, you know, a key because as you get older and you have a family, you know, even when you're on a show for 10 years, at some point that ends and you have to figure out something else to do and other ways to make money. And so, you know, there's different pressures as you age and you just have to kind of be fluid and go with the flow. I think that's such an important perspective for all of us to hear because so often I think there's this idea that if we can just make it, if we can just get that fame or get that recognition, then everyone will love us and we'll be enough and we'll be worthy. And what you're really speaking to there is actually it's so important that we are more than just one thing that we accomplish. And I really appreciate you sharing that perspective. 
think that's really sure. powerful. Absolutely. Yeah. I think most people who are successful, I think that's something they realize or come to realize because I think the more well-rounded and kind of more exposure you get to everything in your life, you know, the better you can be- often become in your field. I mean, I feel like I became a better actor after I went to college and took a few years away from acting because I gained all of these life experiences and things that really helped me become a more interesting person, I think. And therefore, I was able to become, I think, a better actor because I had more to pull from, if that makes sense. Yeah, I really love this perspective that you hold and what you mentioned about even when you were a kid holding this perspective that I am not better than everyone else just because I accomplished this dream. And I think that's an amazing perspective and certainly how it is supporting you, but also how that perspective supports your peers. I mean, it's a very inspirational perspective because you are accomplishing your dreams, but you are not necessarily coming out as, look at me, I accomplished my dreams. You're like, yeah, I did it. And it's like, it's so much more inspiring that way, you know, to your Uh, peers. Thanks. Yeah. Well, you know, I feel like all of the kids that I went to school with, it's like, you know, we all have dreams in life and some of us get to realize them quickly and others take years and years, but no one should be discredited. Everyone's dream is, is equally important and should deserves to be supported, you know, no matter how long it takes or what path you take to get there. And, you know, I have so many friends that I grew up with in elementary school and high school and college who are out doing amazing, wonderful things. And it's inspiring to see them doing well and doing good in their communities and all of that. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of dreams, what is the biggest dream that you have achieved so far? And in what ways did you have to grow to achieve that dream? Honestly, I think my biggest dream in terms of my career was really to be a regular on a TV show. I was lucky enough to sort of get to realize that dream pretty quickly because I booked my first role as a nine year old. And so, you know, I wish I could say that there was all of this growth and stuff that happened. But really, as a kid, you're just in a different mindset. Things, you know, seem less daunting. You don't really know all of the negatives yet and you don't really know all of the realities. And so things just feel a lot more possible at that point, or at least they did for me. And I don't know. I would say that the growth for me, certainly, you know, I had to be willing to put myself out there as a kid. I had to be willing to go into an audition room and prove myself and win people over. And so I think there was definitely growth and courage involved in that aspect of it. But really, where I think the growth in my career has come, I think it's come later and it's come more in you know, after I did Boy Meets World and sort of as I was going through high school and thinking about what was next, you know, I wanted to grow and prove that I could be more than just a child actor. You know, the new dream became not just being on a TV show, but being on a TV show as an adult and showing that I have more depth and complexity than just, you know, the one dimensional nerd character that I was known for. And then after I was lucky enough to get on One Tree Hill, which ended up taking me on this 10 year ride, you know, there was another period of growth where I had to transition from being this college student at Wake, which Blake, you can maybe help me attest to, but (laughs) you know, it's a lot of overachievers there and everyone's busy all the time. And I literally had, you know, whether it was acapella practice or class or extracurricular or community service, there was always something going on. And then I find myself on One Tree Hill where there's like 10 to 12 actors. And the way that works out is technically and schedule wise is that you end up working about maybe two or three days out of the week and the rest of the time you're off. And you can't really go out and look for other jobs because you're contractually obligated to that show for X amount of time. And so I suddenly had all of this free time on my hands And I honestly struggled with that. As sad as that sounds, I I didn't know what to do with myself. And I kind of had to grow and learn how to become competent and in that new arena and how to not let myself just fall into the trap of being a young kid who was making some money and going out and drinking and having a party every night. You know, I had to (laughs) learn to really buckle down and try to do more for myself. So, you know, for me, again, I know a lot of people, there is this growth before a big dream happens, but for me, it it worked out differently. And I think the growth just came a little bit later, but I think growth is such an important part of achieving a dream and then maintaining it and growing beyond it. So I hope that's okay to answer it that way. (laughs) Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm wondering in those long stretches of free time, what did you do? I mean, you mentioned 
needing some time to focus and not just go off and party. I'm curious, what did you do during those times? Yeah, well, look, I'll be honest. I definitely partied. I definitely definitely took advantage of living in a small beach town. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to meet my wife while I was shooting the show through a mutual friend. And so I definitely had my fun. But yes, during the day, you know, I really had to kind of retrain myself. You know, after I graduated from Wake, I was an English major and I'd done so much reading and writing that the last thing I kind of wanted to do was pick up a book for a while. But when I had more time on my hands, it became important to me to fall back in love with reading. And, you know, even if it was just kind of soapy novels or things that, you know, weren't necessarily intellectually stimulating, just kind of things to kind of reawaken my brain and my passion as far as that goes. And I also became heavily invested in working out, which is something that I had never, if you've ever seen a picture of me, that had never been <laughs> up until that time. And, you know, I realized that I had all of this excess energy that I had to channel somewhere. And if I couldn't do that in my job every day, it had to go somewhere. And so, you know, really getting into the gym and becoming, you know, physically more in shape, but also the mental benefits of that, of really having that kind of high when you come out of the gym was extremely helpful for me and really became kind of an outlet for dealing with stress and all the pressures that we talked about earlier. And you just become comfortable with yourself. You know, I had nights where there was nobody to go to dinner with because everybody was working except for me. And I had to go to dinner by myself because I was a bachelor and I didn't know how to cook anything other than tacos or. or (laughs) (laughs) So you have to become comfortable with, you know, going to dinner on your own or going to a movie by yourself in the middle of the day at four o'clock if there's (laughs) nothing else going on and, you know, trying to learn what other actors are doing and absorb all of that. So, yeah, it's kind of a good hodgepodge of things there. I think that's really important reflection. Thank you for sharing that because so much of our lives up until and often through college, if people go to college, is heavily scheduled, heavily scripted, heavily directed. And I think having that time it can feel scary, like you're saying, or sort of the infinite void of (laughs) what am I doing with my life and my time. But I think it is great to use that and to say, actually, listen to yourself, right? What do I want? Who do I want to be? And what do I want to do? So I appreciate you sharing that. And I'm wondering, of your experiences and accomplishments to this point, which of them have surprised you the most? Gosh, you know, When I really look back at my career and I hear you read the intro and kind of my life flashes before my eyes up to this (laughs) point, (laughs) you know, I think I'm most surprised when I look back and being able to work with someone like David Fincher on a couple of his films, because, you know, previously up to working with him, most of the stuff that I had done had been like family fair, like Boy Meets World, stuff that I'm really proud of, by the way. I think it's amazing that there's family shows like Boy Meets World and now later Girl Meets World. And, you know, then I got to do One Tree Hill, which I'm eternally grateful for because it paid a whole lot of my bills. But it wasn't the most critically acclaimed show. You know, we were more of like a teen drama that, you know, found some staying power, luckily. But to go from that to suddenly sitting at a table read with actors like Jake Gyllenhaal and Robert Downey Jr. and Mark Ruffalo and, you know, being even just a small part of that ensemble, that was a big moment for me. And it it was also really the first big film that I'd gotten to do where I actually got to go into a theater with my parents in my hometown and sit down and see myself on the big screen. That was kind of a jarring thing because I'd mostly done television before that. And... So, you know, for me, that was kind of a monumental feat because I felt like I took a big step in showing that I could do more than just be a kid actor at that point. You know, going back on what I said about wanting to grow and prove myself. And then, you know, he was cool enough to call me up to do a cameo in Gone Girl, which is one of my favorite books that I had read before I even knew there was going to be a movie. And so to get to be back on set with him again, because he's such a prolific, interesting director. It was just amazing. So I think those experiences surprise me more than anything else when I look back. Congratulations on them. I mean, that really is a fantastic achievement. And how was that for you going from the TV world, which I'm sure at that point you were very accustomed to the scheduling and moving into the film world? What was that transition like? 
Yeah, it was interesting. And, you know, again, a lot of credit to the producers over at One Tree Hill because Zodiac actually happened while I was filming One Tree Hill. And they were kind enough to recognize that it was a pretty unbelievable opportunity for me. And, you know, they were cool enough to maneuver the scheduling so that I could do it. And, you know, I'm in the beginning of the film. You know, it's not like I was a lead character throughout the film. So, you know, luckily the logistics of it worked out so that I could go and shoot it for a couple of weeks in L.A. or actually in California, not in L.A., and then go back to Wintry Hill. But it was really different. I mean, on television, you know, it's all about timing. Everything has to be done very quickly because you're on a schedule. You have to get X amount of shows finished before they start airing. And if you don't, if you fall behind, then you're in trouble. So everything is really moves like clockwork and becomes, you know, especially on a show like One Tree Hill where we went for so long, it became a very well oiled machine of everything happened at this time and pretty quickly and then on to the next episode and on to the next one. And then you step on David Fincher's set and you do your first take, which is me running up to a car at the very beginning of the movie. And he has me run up to the car 47 times. <laughs> and literally, to go from a TV show where you're asked to do maybe to do a lot of takes on a TV show was like maybe five or six, you know, generally you get like a couple of shots, you know, in the master and then in your close up, and that's kind of it. But you know, on a, on this film with Fincher, it's 47 times of running up to the car because he's such a perfectionist and because he has such great products, you know, he has a little bit more leeway in terms of the studios allowing him to have a little bit more time and freedom. And it was very different. You know, I went back and sat in my chair after that. And one of the PAs came up to me and offered me a bottle of water and could tell that I kind of looked dejected. And he was like, are you OK? And I was like, well, I like, am I going to get fired? It took 47 takes. <laughs> he was like, dude, Mark Ruffalo's first take was 62 takes. <laughs> Seven. You know, it was like this is just the way that Fincher operates. And so. I really had to become accustomed to that very quickly. And it became a huge challenge, but also one of the most rewarding things I've ever done in my life. Will you share a story of the most significant challenge you faced so far and what it was like for you to overcome it? Sure. You know, I think to go back to our time at Wake, Blake, you know, finishing my senior year there was very important to me, but I had booked One Tree Hill as a junior actually at Wake. That's when the pilot episode was cast. So I did the pilot and junior year and then senior year we found out we were picked up to series and I had to go to the deans at Wake and to my professors and kind of again explain that this is a unique opportunity and it doesn't come around for actors or for people that very often. And would you be willing to help me do this so that I can, you know, not throw away the last three years of my life and be able to graduate, but also be able to take advantage of this very cool opportunity to work. And to their credit, they were amazing at helping me do that. But it was such a significant challenge because, you know, we've Wake Forest is in for those people not familiar with North Carolina is in Winston Salem, which is towards the western part of the state. And then we shot One Tree Hill in Wilmington, which is on the east coast. It's about a three and a half, four hour drive down I-40. And by the end of that year, I could drive I-40 with my eyes closed. I mean, it was, <laughs> I was back and forth so much and I was, you know, on set sometimes all night because a lot of the shoots on One Tree Hill were night shoots where we're outside on a basketball court and I've got my Wake Forest issued IBM ThinkPad on my lap and I'm typing essays and emailing them in from my hotel room, you know, to my professor and, and then, you know, shooting all night and then waking up the next day and having to drive back to Winston-Salem to be there for a test that I had to be there to take in person. You know, sometimes my mom was concerned about the lack of sleep that I was getting and would meet me halfway in between to drive me the rest of the way so that I could sleep for an hour and a half or two hours before I got back to wake. And so it was really incredible, but it's probably one of the things I'm most proud of when I look back because, you know, I got to finish college, which is a really big deal to me. And I also got to do the first year of this show, which ended up, you know, as I've said, leading me on this kind of 10 year journey career wise. So it was a really crazy year. I lost weight. I lost sleep, but <laughs> It all kind of worked out and made for one of the most interesting times that I can remember. 
Well, that's such a testament to your dedication and your capacity. And I think moments like that are really important to hear about because they do remind us that something can look impossible on the surface. But if you have a supportive network, if you're willing to be flexible, and sometimes, like you said, if you're willing to sacrifice some sleep for a year, it's really possible. And I don't know if this ever happened, so you might have to remind me. But sure, yeah, I do recall... There was a period of time in our acapella group when you were filming, but you couldn't say where. And I just remember, finally, the president of our acapella group, Jen, said to us one day, guys, Lee is filming with Cisco, like the R&B singer Cisco, <laughs> and a monkey. And we were all like, that's so random and crazy. Did that ever happen? Am I just, am I imagining that? It totally happened, and... <laughs> No offense to Cisco, I have tried to block it out because it was the worst <laughs> film that was ever made. It was an independent film that was shot in Costa Rica, which was actually the best part of it because I'd never been to Costa Rica. But yeah, it was this little indie and it turned out to be terrible. It was just not a good director. Definite learning and growing experience as an actor for sure, where you learn that you don't have to say yes to everything that you're offered. <laughs> and, and that was really important for me to learn. But yes, that definitely happened. You did not take a strange trip anywhere. <laughs> It was. It was quite an experience, to say the least. That's so funny. Well, you've already shared so many great pieces of wisdom and perspectives so far. I'm wondering if there's other advice you would give to millennials who are on their journey towards fulfillment and success. Sure. You know, I think first and foremost, identify what it is that you want to do or achieve. And that can be really difficult. We live in an age where there's so many distractions and opportunities and avenues, which is a really wonderful thing, you know, particularly with technology, but it can also be challenging to sort of hone in and figure out exactly where it is that you fit in and what you want to do. So I would say first, you know, really spend some time with yourself figuring out what that is. And then once you know what it is, as I touched on before, don't let anyone put you in a box or deter you from that. If you know in your heart that that's what you're meant to do, you know, in this industry as a kid, all the time, people would just say, you know, he's the nerd because of the first noteworthy role that I had, you know, but since then I've gotten to go on and play a weird murder victim, a cop, a racist killer, a battered and abused kid and all these other things. And, you know, that took a lot of pushback against my agents and my managers saying, no, send me out for these parts. I can do this. So I think that applies to lots of different careers, not just acting, as we talked about. People tend to put people in boxes. So if they're putting you in a box that you don't want to be in, you know, push back against that. And then the other thing I would say is if the rules don't work for you to do something, you know, within reason, create your own rules. You know, most kids who wanted to be on TV picked up and moved to Los Angeles with their families and you know, rented apartments and stayed out here for months looking for work. And that wasn't a reality for my family. It just wasn't something that we were willing to do. So, you know, we had to look for a way to compromise and try to give me a shot at my dream, but also not abandon this life that we knew. And so for me, that meant putting myself on tape a lot in my house you know, with my mom. And back then it was an old VHS tape recorder and submitting tapes that way. And so I probably lost out on a lot of roles because I wasn't in the room in LA auditioning. But for me, those are the rules that I wanted to play by. I wasn't willing to give up my everyday life of going to school just to pursue this one dream. And so, you know, it's not always possible to create your own rules. I understand that. But where you can and within reason, if things aren't working for you the way other people have done them, look for ways to do it in your own way. And yeah, I think that's most of what I would say to people. What I'm hearing from you is both, and this is consistently during our conversation, both this ability to really listen to yourself and what you're wanting, and then also to advocate for yourself and ask for support when you need it and create your own rules when you need to. And I think that that's really wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, you hit it on the head. You have to advocate for yourself because unfortunately, you know, not many people are going to do it for you. It's really up to you to be, you know, your biggest cheerleader and to really put yourself out there. So I think that's a really important point. Would you share a book or a quote that changed the direction of your life? 
That is so tough. I think, you know, one book that really resonated with me was The Power of Now. I don't know if either of you have... Oh, yeah. We're advocates. That's that's one of our favorite books. (laughs) Yeah. 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 (laughs) You know, there's obviously a reason for Mm -hmm. that. I mean, it's Mm -hmm. really challenging me to think about life differently. So if I had to pick a book, maybe that one. Not so sure about a quote. You know, but I'll be honest. Again, I'm going to create my own rules here for your question. (laughs) I, I think that... What really changed the direction of my life the most was meeting my wife. She taught me to approach life in a very different way than I'm mentally sort of wired to do. And a lot of these things that you're hearing about me, you know, identifying and listening to myself and going after things and growing is really because of her and because of the way she has challenged me to grow in the way that I think about things. And certainly as a support system when I'm tired or when I feel like I'm stuck and you know she's helped me kind of pick up and keep going with that so I know she's not a book or a quote but if you find a good person (laughs) a good person in your life obviously can make a world of difference so oh yeah I'm sure that she has many quotes actually probably that you could think of like a moment that she said something really meaningful to you or many moments actually she's a whole bunch of quotes (laughs) and just the ability to like she's just so like calm and approaches everything in a very like thought out way and whereas I'm sometimes just like you know reactionary and I just take something and just react immediately without thinking about it and so yeah she should like start a coaching course or something I don't know (laughs) I'm curious to know how the power of now showed up in your life like what was it that was such a monumental change for you yeah, she gave me that book. So when, <laughs> cool. <laughs> once again, direct credit to her. Yeah, just, you know, living in the present. It feels like one of those things that you already know, but, you know, he lays it out in such a way that really clicks and makes the way that you approach everyday life just different. And I think it's so important to be present, particularly in this day and age with what we're going through politically as a country, with what we go through and struggles in our own life, with our careers and our families, to be present and to not get ahead of ourselves, to not dwell in the past. You know, it would be very easy for me to sit back and relive my glory days when I was on television as a kid. But, you know, where do you grow? How do you go beyond that? What are you doing in the present to challenge yourself and to move forward? And how do you not get tripped up on being anxious about the future? And well, if I stop acting and I become a desk job at an agency somewhere, you know, is my family going to be financially as stable as we are now? You know, there's all these anxieties that you can get tripped up in. And so I feel like a lot of that book helped me hone in on just taking it one day at a time, one step at a time, doing the best you can in that moment and not getting tripped up on the past or the future. Mm. Thinking of being present, how was it for you going back on Girl Meets World and that cameo appearance because which I've watched a few times by the way it just makes me so happy to see you just like <laughs> show up there talking but how was that for you being really at a very different place in your life I'm sure now than when you were obviously filming Boy Meets World and how was that for you Yeah it was a really interesting experience it's one of those things you never know what's going to come back around in this business I mean you know that was a show that I did when I was 12 years old And here I am as a 30 something year old (laughs) and, you know, reprising that role, you know, never in my wildest dreams did I think that would happen. You know, I thought my days of donning the Minkus glasses were over, (laughs) (laughs) but it was really cool. I have to say, you know, I think Michael Jacobs, who was the creator of Boy Meets World and Girl Meets World, really identified that, you know, there's kind of a lack of good family TV on right now. So much of what's on TV is very grown up and, you know, there's not a ton of shows that are for kids that are not just preaching to kids that are kind of trying to reach them in a more realistic way. And I think that's what Boy Meets World kind of excelled at. And I think that's what the goal was with Girl Meets World. And for me in particular, it was interesting to do it because... A lot of people may not realize, some do, but some may not realize, I only did Boy Meets World for the first season. They aged the show up and my character was written out. And so that was a very tough thing for me at the age of 12 because I had helped create this show. I'd helped it become a hit and a success and people had responded well to my character and to then be told that I wasn't coming back 
was tough. You know, immediately the question is, what did I do wrong? Or, you know, what is it that's causing this? And ultimately it was a business decision and it was a money decision and, you know, things that I now understand looking back on it. But it was really fulfilling for me to step back on the set of Girl Meets World and see all of those people again and to have shown them that that didn't stop me, that I went on and I kept acting and that I kept working at my career. And they all were just so excited to see what I had done and were so complimentary and welcoming and saying this character, even though it wasn't in the whole show, is one of the most important characters in the history of the series. We wish you'd been on the whole time. We're so happy to have you back. And, you know, that really brought things full circle for me and made me feel valued and, you know, it gave me nice closure on that show and experience. It really was a triumphant moment. And I'm so glad that you were able to have that experience. Yeah. Yeah, it was fun. And of course, seeing, you know, the cast, they're all great. And just seeing Ben and Danielle and Ryder and Mr. Feeney, everybody. You know, it's just, <laughs> it really fun. They're all great people. And it was so fun to reconnect with everybody. Thank you so much for being here. This has been an awesome conversation. Before we wrap up, would you share with the audience how they can connect with you and what you're up to? I'm slowly coming around to that. And so I'm very much a newbie when it comes to public social media. But I do now have a Facebook page. It's very new. It's in the works. It's called at Lee Norris official is the way to get to it on Facebook. I don't even have my check mark yet. I'm just beginning to figure out what you have to do to get that. Probably have to sell my soul or something. I don't know. We will attest that you are verified. This is the real you. We, we, we've yeah. really been talking with you for the past 45 minutes. It's true. So that's kind of the best thing. I really had to start that because there's all of these conventions now associated with One Tree Hill, which is really mind boggling to me. But it became important for me to have a way to talk to my fans and people that watch the shows and be able to communicate with them directly. So that's my outlet for that. Stay tuned for Twitter and other things that may be coming. And I will say this is so cool for me to get to do this podcast because my wife and I, one of our creative kind of passion projects that we're working on is our own podcast. <laughs> it is totally the antithesis of this podcast, which is so much more noble and inspiring than what we're doing. <laughs> so once you listen to this podcast, flip on over to ours, which is Married with Television. And it's about a married couple who basically escape the pressures of the world every day by sitting down and watching the crappiest reality TV shows you can imagine. <laughs> and just totally escaping. And so I think we're going to hit up some of the Bravo shows, which I didn't even know what Bravo was until I met my wife, but it has totally changed my world now. <laughs> and yes, so I'll be posting about that more on my Facebook page. And we also, I think we just got a Facebook page set up for that. It's at Married with Television Podcast on Facebook. So it, totally not as professional as you guys, just for fun. But you know, <laughs> if you're into that kind of thing, check it out. So, <laughs> Well, I'm excited to check it out. Yeah, me too. <laughs> That's awesome. Lee, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Absolutely. It was so good to catch up with you, Blake, and to, to meet you, Ivy, and uh, best of luck to both of you, and I hope we get to catch up again sooner rather than later. The Motivational Millennial Podcast is supported by Motivational Millennial Coaching Services. We help you find clarity and confidence so you can take action toward living your dream life. To learn more about one-on-one -on -one personalized support from someone who believes you have a path to fulfillment and wants to help you uncover it, visit www.motivationalmillennial.com slash coaching. Welcome back. This is the after show. <laughs> that was so enthusiastic. I love I it. Know, you started laughing. No, I just normally, said, welcome back. No, no, you're just like, hello. <laughs> welcome. This is like, welcome back, friends. I was trying something new. <laughs> it was good. It was very theatrical. <laughs> what? L like acting. Like Lee Norris has. Okay. I was trying that was to... too much of a stretch. I didn't... But you know what? I don't get it a lot of the times, I guess. Well, if I had chosen a better pun, it probably worked better. Anyway, Ivy, what did you enjoy from our conversation <laughs> with Lee? Yeah, it was great. I really loved chatting with him. 
It was so interesting just to get his perspective on what it was like to be an actor and have a job. Have a job from the time that you're nine. I mean, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you're like employed really early. I mean, (laughs) and you have a lot of responsibilities. Probably wasn't, you know, seeing it necessarily in that way, but that's really cool. So it was a great conversation. I think one of the things that stood out to me was really this theme that he had about advocating for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I saw it come up a couple of ways. One was when he was in college and he was presented with this great opportunity to be on the show, but he still wanted to finish his degree. And instead of just sort of giving up or not looking for support or just not searching for alternative options, Mm -hmm. he asked for help from his professors and was like, this is a really great opportunity. Will you help me accomplish that? And so I think that that was really great. I mean, in this instance, and also another instance where just even from when he was young, and he was talking about setting his own rules. When he was young, how a lot of families would move to LA or something to try and get their kid a gig, but that his family just didn't want to do that, but they still wanted him to have that opportunity. And so they worked together to find another option. Both of these examples are showcasing how he was living with a state of empowerment rather than coming from victimhood, Mm -hmm. you know, because I think advocating for yourself, I think asking for support, I think creating your own rules, they all are under this theme of feeling empowered and not feeling like you are powerless or that there's hopelessness, you know, that you can't change anything. You can't do anything. There are no other options. It's just how it is. Yeah, motivational speaker Joe Fingerhut has this great phrase that I love, which is always ask, how can I? Like in any of these situations, like you're saying, if you're going for something instead of being like, these are all the reasons why it won't work or it can't happen, change that question you asked to how can I? And that's exactly what you're saying. Lee and his family said, how can we pursue this path while still maintaining the things that are really important to us and sticking to our values? Yeah, and I think that Sometimes when we're in a victim mindset, we're unaware of that because we just see obstacles and we just see reasons why we can't do something or we can't pursue a certain path. And we're letting ourselves fall into a position of powerlessness. I mean, there are lots of things that we can't control, but yeah, how can I is a great perspective because it's what can I control and what are available options? I mean, it's when you start empowering yourself by believing that there are a variety of ways to reach the outcome that you want and not be super stuck on the exact original path that you thought, it shifts the way your brain works. Speaking from personal experience, you know, <laughs> because I definitely, I grew up and was raised with this victim mindset. And just felt really powerless all the time. You know, ugh, it was so, so uncomfortable. But then when I noticed when I started really applying like my creativity and my innovation and my vision brain to my circumstances, it was like just expanding, mm-hmm. you know, and opened all these pathways. Yeah, I think also you can be empowered in certain areas of your life and not in others. Mm-hmm. So, for example, it was interesting when you were saying being in the victim mindset earlier in your life. And I was thinking about how for me, I felt pretty empowered in the academic world. But when it came to the business world, I think I also had this thing of like, well, if I'm not being financially successful, it's just because I'm bad at it, or I'm not good enough, and I'll never be good enough, or I don't deserve it. Like Mm -hmm. other people should have the success. Like, I don't deserve to have financial abundance. And what really shifted it for me was seeing that all those things I just said weren't true. And the way I could prove they weren't is if I applied enough effort in a certain direction and was willing to listen to feedback and just keep persisting and iterating over and over again, eventually I could come up with a speech that the schools would pay me to come and deliver to their students. Or we would develop a workshop that community colleges and small business centers would bring in to help their entrepreneurial and business students. And 
the more that happens, the more I realize there isn't some cosmic conspiracy to keep me from financial <laughs> abundance. It's just literally that I need to be willing to sit with it and persist hmm. and not let all these internal stories stop me from taking the amount of action necessary to see results. I feel so inspired by you right now. Well, thank you. There's so much energy happening. I'm doing the fist pump of victory. <laughs> Oh, gosh. So what was your big takeaway today? Well, aside from the fact that Lee is just a wonderful human, I think that's the thing I'm always reminded every time I interact (laughs) with him. And I didn't want to blow him up in the middle of the interview, but I do remember this one time he (laughs) borrowed some Halloween costumery from me at one point. And I just remember when he returned it, he was just so grateful. He was like, dude, thank you so much for hooking me up, man. This is so kind. I was like, yo, I literally just gave you like this one little thing or whatever. And so (laughs) it was so nice. Anyway, he's a lovely person. But I think the takeaway from the conversation that really stuck out to me, and I noted it a bit when we were talking is this idea of having a more complex identity and not putting all of our worth on a single achievement that will eventually make us successful or worthy of love or happiness. And it reminds me of a quote by this incredible author and speaker and social justice advocate, Brian Stevenson, when he says, each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. And I think that also applies in the converse, which is each of us is also more than the best thing we've ever done. Mm. And so I think it can be really tempting to define ourselves by a single moment, whether good or bad. And this obviously happens a lot in the criminal justice system, which is where Brian Stevenson is focused. Mm. But I think so much of it happens in our own lives, you know? The one time we got an F in a class and that meant we were never going to be good enough to be a mathematician or an engineer or something, or we couldn't learn a foreign language because one time someone made fun of us. And so I think it's a really great reminder to look at ourselves and all of our experiences in context and in perspective, because most of the time when I'm freaking out about something is because I'm making it so important in that moment. Whereas if I can just take a moment and step back and zoom out a little bit, I will realize that the arc of the lifespan is long and there are going to be more opportunities, both good and bad, and we are all more complex than a single defining event. When I think of single defining events... This keeps coming up for me, particularly because we've been working a lot with the growth mindset. And for those who don't know, the growth mindset is, I mean, there's a couple of aspects to it. One is that, you know, you're not going to be good at something when you start, but just because you're not good at it when you start doesn't mean that you're not going to be good at it later. And what essentially it's saying is that our brains can grow, our neurons can get stronger and we make bigger connections. And that when we practice at something, We get better at that one thing, but we also get better at learning and better about doing anything. It's like strengthening a muscle with different types of exercise. So this is obviously on my mind. I know a lot about this right now, but man, I gotta say, it's so funny you're talking about not defining yourself based on one moment, but this keeps flashing in my mind and there's a part of me that thinks like, gosh, I'm like such a hypocrite because of this (laughs) one thing that I did when I was like 17 years old. Like it comes up because when I was 17, I was like, I'm going to be a softball player. Not like professionally, but like I wanted to play softball and I signed up for this like summer YMCA something. And I went to the tryout. Needless to say, because I'd literally played softball like three times in my life, I was awful. Mm -hmm. I was so awful. Like I could not even hit the ball. (laughs) And one of the coaches like took me aside because I was with all of these other women who had been playing since they're freaking toddlers probably, you know? And I'm like there, and I'm just taken aside by this one coach, you know, and he's spending like the entire time just trying to help me hit the freaking ball, like just throwing the ball at me. Dude, I straight up never went back. Mm -hmm. I was just so humiliated on so many levels because I was just so terrible and I felt like bad for drawing this. Obviously there were many layers. But I want to, like, really release that. It's like somehow that's, like, how I, like, approach my life. Like, I feel like every time the growth mindset comes up, I'm like, oh, gosh. 
<laughs> there was that one time that I just blatantly ignored the growth mindset. <laughs> like, you know, like somehow I even know about it. But I'm like, and how many other things did I quit before I could have gotten better? I don't know. So I think about that. And then I also think about what you're saying, which is that was a long time ago. And now I know. <laughs> now I yeah, you, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> Not letting yourself be defined by your lack of using the growth mindset that one time. I know. It's so silly. But, you know, that's what happened. No, it's true. One of the things that Carol Dweck, who really publicized the growth mindset, talks about is how we can have the growth mindset in some areas of our life and not in others. Mm. So I think it's really interesting <laughs> yeah. to look at like how you, for example, are a huge advocate of personal growth like, and you have developed your own inner world and approach to life and yourself and understanding and everything. And so in that sense, you had an extreme growth mindset sure, yeah. in that area, <laughs> but maybe softball, not so much. Anything athletic. Yeah. Was I rollerblading? Oh, gosh. Back yeah. in the day. Which, when we become aware of it, I think is useful. Yeah, exactly. Especially, I think of CrossFit, for example, which I've been doing for a couple of years now. But there are some movements where I still am kind of clunky in terms of my execution of them. And... Part of what I just have to keep reminding myself is you don't get better by not doing it. You know? <laughs> like, the only way you get better at something is by doing it. You can't think about doing it or read about doing it necessarily. Usually, especially with the things that are very physical, like you're saying, like softball or weightlifting or whatever. The best way to get better at it is to do it. And you have to start bad before you get better. Yeah. And the thing that you're talking about with the multi-layered identity essentially is that like don't put yourself in a box either that you're so great at this one thing that that's the only thing that you should do forever or that you're bad at this one thing so you should never do that thing mm -hmm. you know yeah yeah and that somehow you're not worthy or you're the best person in the world <laughs> depending on which side of it because you either can or can't do that one thing. And that's another reminder, too, I think, for millennials especially, because we see so many opportunities and so many people doing cool things. Mm -hmm. And we think, oh, I could never be as good as that person is at that thing. Or, you know, I should really be good at marketing or speaking or networking or whatever. And what I just realized after we've had so many of these amazing conversations is, there is a giant array of skills out there. And some people have several of them really highly honed. Some people have many of them at a decent level. And it is totally cool if we don't have all of the boxes ticked in each of these areas that we are great at. And if we identify some of them as we think they're valuable to get better at, then cool, we can focus on those and improve those. But I've really had to release the social media comparison thing of seeing, oh, wow, not only is this person a great speaker, but they're also really funny and they can speak four languages mm. in their speech. And, <laughs> you know, while I'm not afraid to bust out quadrilingual MC every once in a while, <laughs> I certainly can't at this stage in my life deliver an entire motivational speech for 60 minutes in French, Spanish, English, and Arabic. So... But we need to release it, is what I'm saying. <laughs> so this is a day of release. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you for sharing that with me. Well, thank you. And thank you to all of our awesome listeners for tuning in to this great conversation with Lee Norris. If you haven't already, head over to MotivationalMillennial.com where you can download a free personal transformation guide with some motivational tools to help overcome any limiting mindsets that you might be facing. Also, you can see all of our previous episodes and you can listen to those on there. You can also subscribe to us on iTunes. We appreciate any rating and reviewing that you do on there. Every little bit helps. And finally, we'd just love to hear from you what you liked about this conversation with Lee, what you want to know more about, and who you want to have on here in the future. Oh, that'd be great. Awesome. All the those things. Yes. <laughs> just share the world. It's big. It's beautiful. And it smiles like Lee Norris. <laughs> I was going to say, you're like, it's big, it's beautiful. And I was or so are you. Oh, that's great. Well, that's true, and too. And Norris's smile. And so <laughs> <laughs> All of these things are big and beautiful. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Peace and love, friends. 
for show notes and upcoming guests or to learn more about Coactive Coaching, the blog, and our other awesome offerings, visit MotivationalMillennial.com. Keep in touch with us at Facebook.com slash MotivationalMillennial. We'd love to hear from you. Shoot us an email with your thoughts, comments, and suggestions at podcast at MotivationalMillennial.com. And tell us who you might like to hear from or if you think you or anyone you know would be good for the show. The Motivational Millennial Podcast is edited by Christy Hostler and Team Podcast. Our theme music was composed and performed by Blake Brandis. Have, Have a great, great week, week, Motivational Millennials! millennials.